This is Origins Homilies on Joshua, beginning with Homily 1. God gave the name that is above every name to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For this name that is above every name is Jesus. Because this is the name that is above every name, at that name of Jesus, every knee is bowed and of those in heaven and on earth and beneath the earth. And because this is the name above every name, for many generations it was given to no one. Moses wrote the book of Genesis, where we read of Abraham and of those who were begotten by him. As many as possible of these persons were upright, but none deserved to be called Jesus. Abel was not named Jesus, nor the one who began to call upon the name of the Lord God, not the one who pleased God and was translated, whose corpse was not found, nor Noah, the one who alone in this generation was found righteous before God, not even Abraham himself, who was received the promises of the covenant, nor Isaac, who was born from him, not Jacob, the supplanter, nor any one of his sons. Moses was faithful in all God's house, and yet not even he was called Jesus. But in the book of Exodus, I find the name Jesus for the first time, and I want to consider closely when it was first given. Scripture says, Amalek came and was fighting against Israel, and Moses spoke to Jesus in Rephidim. This is the first mention of the name Jesus. You might know the name as Joshua if you are reading in most English Bibles. Moses said, Choose mighty men for yourself from among all the sons of Israel, and go out and fight tomorrow with Amalek. Moses acknowledges that he cannot lead the army. He acknowledges that he cannot even gather it. Although he led the people out of the land of Egypt, therefore he called Jesus and said, Choose men for yourself and go out. You see whom Moses allowed to carry on the war against Amalek. Thus, we, we first become acquainted with the name Jesus when, he, when we see him as a leader of the army, not as one with whom Moses joined his leadership, but the one to whom Moses granted primacy. Moses was not able to choose mighty men. You, he says, Choose mighty men for yourself from among the sons of Israel. Therefore, when I become acquainted with with the name of Jesus for the first time, I also immediately see the symbol of a mystery. Indeed, Jesus leads the army. And it happened that when Moses lifted up his hands, Israel prevailed. But when he put put his hands down, Amalek prevailed. So too, Jesus grows stronger and conquers when Moses raises up his hands. When Moses, however, did not lift up his hands but let them sink downwards, the people were conquered by Amalek. So people are those to whom Jesus said, If you believed Moses, you would certainly believe me. And behold, do, do you seek to kill me, you who do not keep the law? Since the law and the works of the law are meaningless among those who seek to establish their own righteousness and are not submissive to the righteousness of God, the hands of Moses were lowered, disbelief prevailed, and the people were conquered. Nadab, Abihu, and Eleazar are left behind in the camp to judge the people. Jethro, too, is left to judge the people with them. But Jesus is not left behind. He follows Moses into the mountain. The addition of a marvelous word reveals that he was assisting Moses. How was he assisting him? Not as a follower, not as an inferior, but as a minister and defender. But why is it that when Jesus is first mentioned, the name of his father is not indicated, even in the second or third time? But when his father, Nun, is mentioned, Jesus is not called Jesus, but Hosea. For the first time written as Hosea among the list are of those who were sent to spy out the land. It seems to me that possibly for the purpose of this, his office of spying, he was called Hosea, not Jesus, and he is named the son of Nun. But when he returns after that work is completed and all the people are terrified, and when he alone encourages the people who stumbled and raises up their despair, then He was named Jesus by Moses, not the son of Nun, but the one to whom Moses had said, lead the army and fight with Amalek. 
We see his greatness even more when we consider that during the transfiguration, Moses' face was weakened, the vi- so weakened the vision of the sons of Israel that no one could look at his face. Jesus, however, not only looks directly at the face, but even stays inside the tabernacle as a sharer of the mysteries. To what then do all these things lead us? Obviously to this, that the book does not so much indicate to us the deeds of the Son of Nun as it represents for us the mysteries of Jesus by Jesus, my Lord. For he himself is the one who assumes power after the death of Moses. He is the one who leads the army and fights against Amalek. What was foreshadowed there on the mountain by lifted hands was the time when he attaches them to his cross, triumphing over the principalities and powers on it. Thus Moses is dead, for the law was ceased, because the law and the prophets extended only up to John. Do you want me to bring forth proofs from the scriptures that the law is called Moses? Hear what he says is, Hear what he says in the gospel. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Here, without any doubt, he calls the law Moses. Therefore, Moses, the servant of God, is dead, for the law is dead, and the legal precepts are now invalid. Or, if what I propose does not hold enough authority for you, follow the authority of the apostle who says, A woman, so long as her husband lives, is bound by the law, and she will be called an adulteress, if she should be with another man. If her husband dies, however, she is released from the law and of the husband and is not an adulteress if she should be with another man. The word woman doubtless stands for the soul that has that was held fast by the law of Moses, and about which it is said, so long as her husband lives, she is bound by the law. But if her husband, doubtless the law, has died, her, so, her he calls her soul, which seems to be bound, released. Therefore, if Therefore, it is necessary for the law to die so that those who believe in Jesus should not commit the sin of adultery. Thus, Jesus, my Lord and Savior, assumed the leadership. If it seems fitting, let us compare the deeds of Moses with the leadership of Jesus. When Moses led the people out of the land of Egypt, there was no discipline among the people, no ritual order among the priests. They passed through the water of the sea, a salty water with no sweetness at all in it. And there was not for them a wall of water to the right and to the left. I'm sorry, and there was for them a wall of water to the right and to the left. We know these are the deeds of Moses when he was the leader. But when the law, but when the Lord leads the army, let us see that things were already foreshadowed at that time. The priests proceed, and the Ark of the Covenant is carried on the shoulders of the priests. Nowhere now is nowhere now is the sea. Nowhere does the salty billow roll. But with my Lord Jesus as the leader, I come to the Jordan, not in the confusion of light and not terrified by fear, but with the priest who carry on their neck shoulders the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord in which the law of God and the divine letters are kept. I enter the Jordan, not in furtive silence, but with the sound of trumpets blaring something mystical and divine, so that I may step to the proclamation of the heavenly trumpet. There it was said that the water was divided into two parts, and one part became a wall on the right and the other on the left. But here the one who comes to destroy the center wall of the partition makes both one. Indeed, on one side the water was straight up, but the other side flowed into the sea. Hence Jesus says, Prepare food for yourselves, for yourself, for the journey. And now, if you are listening, Jesus says to you, If you will follow me, prepare food for yourself for the journey. For these foods are the works that accompany us like a trusty satchel on the journey to come. Since it is not fitting to read the divine message carelessly, and if it in passing, let us consider from what source he orders those who have no provisions to acquire food. For manna used to be their food. But when we have crossed over the banks of the river, the manna ceases. And so anyone who has not prepared food for himself will not be able to follow Jesus as he enters the land of promise. But consider what fruit he took first in the land of promise. 
At that time, Scripture says, they first ate the fruits of the region of palms, and they first ate the unleavened bread. You see, therefore, that to us who first depart from the way of the world, if we rightfully follow Jesus, the first palm of victory is presented. And when the yeast of malice and wickedness are rejected, the unleavened bread of integrity and truth are prepared for us. Nevertheless, our Jesus sends spies to the king of Jericho, and they are received hospitably by a prostitute. But the prostitute who receives the spies sent by Jesus was no longer a prostitute since she received them. Indeed, every one of us was a prostitute in his heart as long as he lived according to the desires and lust of the flesh. But she received the spies of Jesus, messengers whom he sent before his face to prepare his way. If any soul receives such messengers in faith, it must not lodge them into low or inferior places, but in lofty and high ones. For we did not receive the Lord Jesus from low and earthly places, but from as proceeding from the Father and coming down from heaven. But I do not interpret the flax straw in which the spies hid themselves apart from symbols. For flax is used for priestly garments. This means either that a priestly stalk was offered to those who were to have been invited, as the Apostle Peter says, you are a holy people, a priestly kingdom, or else that there was a secret summoning of this people who are from the nations, hidden in the symbol of the law, where something is about to be is about said about priests. Immediately, therefore, the prostitute came under the wrath of the king of Jericho. Why was this, if not because the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh? Again, scripture says, the world hates you because it hated me before you. Therefore, is there is therefore a certain king, the enemy of the prostitute, who is prince of this world. He pursues and wants to seize the spies of Jesus, but he cannot accomplish that, for they make their journey through the mountains. They do not go through low places, nor are they charmed by valleys, but they eagerly pursue the highest hills and mountain peaks. Indeed, our prostitute says, I have lifted up my eyes to the mountain, from where will help come to me? The prince of this world is not able to ascend to that place, nor can he reach Jesus by the highest road. On the contrary, if, to tempt him, he should place him in the heights, he says, cast yourself down, because he always loves low and fallen things. It is among these things that he reigns. It is among these things that he establishes his throne, and among them he would descend into hell. Moses did not say, let the sun stand still, nor did he command the greatest elements as Jesus set did. Jesus says, Let the sun stand still over Gibeon, and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. Scripture adds to this and says, Never in the way did God listen to a man. Not that time only did not that time only did my Jesus make the sun to stand, but also in as much as greater in a much greater way at his coming. When we wage war against our enemies and fight against principalities and powers and rulers of these dark things, against the spirits of wickedness in the heavens, the sun of our righteousness constantly stands by and never at any time deserts us or hastens to go down. For he himself said, Behold, I am with you for all days. He is not only with us for a doubled day, that, but he is with us for all days until the end of the age, until we prevail over our adversaries. But let us also see what it is that Jesus promises to his soldiers. He says, Every place you have set, the soles of your feet will be yours. He, has set, he had said this to those living at the time concerning the terror the Ter territories of the Canaanites, of the Perizzites, of the Jebusites, and of the rest of the people whose territories they seized as an inheritance after expelling the unworthy inhabitants. But let us consider what is promised to those in these words. There are certain diabolical races of powerful adversaries against whom we wage a battle and against whom we struggle in this life. However, many of these races we set under our feet. However many we conquer in battle, 
We shall seize their territories, their provinces, and their realms, as Jesus our Lord apportions them to us. For they were once angels, they were glorified in the kingdom of God. Or do or do we not read in Isaiah that Isaiah says of one of them, How did Lucifer fall, the one who's in the morning? That Lucifer, without a doubt, had a throne in the heavens until he became a fugitive angel. If I should conquer him and set him under my feet, if I should deserve that the Lord Jesus crush Satan under his feet, I shall deserve a consequence to receive the place of Lucifer in heaven. Thus we understand the promise to us from our Lord Jesus that every place we set the soles of our feet will be ours. But let us not imagine that we may be able to enter into the inheritance yawning and drowsy through ease and negligence. The wrath of his own race possesses the angel, Lucifer. Unless you vanquish this wrath in yourself and cut off all violent impulses of anger and rage, you will not be able to claim as an inheritance the place the angel once had. For you will not expel him from the land of promise by your slothfulness. In like manner, some angels incite pride, jealousy, greed, and lust and instigate e these evil things. Unless you gain the mastery over their vices in yourself and exterminate them from your land, which now through the grace of baptism has been sanctified, you will not receive the fullness of the promised inheritance. In the time of Moses, it was not said as it is in Jesus' time that the land rested from wars. It is certain that also this land of ours in which we have struggles and endured contests will be able to rest from battles by the strength of the Lord Jesus alone. Within us, indeed, are all those breeds of vices that continually and incessantly attack the soul. Within us are Canaanites, within us are Perizzites, here are the Jebusites. In what way must we exert ourselves? How vigilant must we be, or for how long must we preserve, so that when all these breeds of vices have been forced to flee, our land may rest from the wars at last. It is for this purpose that the prophet urges that we mediate, meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. This continual meditation on the divine word, on the divine, sorry, on the divine word is like some trumpet rousing your souls for battle, so that you do not sleep while the enemy is awake. Since the day is not sufficient for med meditation, night is also added. But what will you do, you who do not, who not only sleep at night, but also devote the entire day to worldly occupations or carnal delights, and hardly even come to church on appointed days? Indeed, some of you, even when you come, do not come because you spend time coming for gossip, not for the word of God. On account of this, the divine word says to you, Arise, you who sleep, arise from the dead, so you may take a hold of Christ. Rise from the dead is said to those who continue in the works of death, persisting in the filthiness and heinous ways that, although they were not evident to human beings, are known to God. Repent of this and turn back to the Lord with your whole heart. Spend time in prayers. Spend time in the word of God. What good is it if we fast for our sins that, that commit and, com and then commit them again? What good is it to wash and then wallow again in the mire? Have you fasted for some time? This is just as if you have marched away from Egypt for a while. You have crossed the Red Sea and have followed Moses by observing the precepts and commandments of the law. But now Jesus receives you from Moses and even circumstance, circumcises you a second time in the place that is called the Hill of Foreskins. It is not only the worship of idols that you cast away in the beginning that needs to be circumcised, but greed, which is a more subtle worship of idols. You must circumcise anew. Therefore, Jesus, circumcising the people with a second circumcision, says, Today I have taken away from you the reproach of Egypt. As long as we sin, as long as the vices of the passions reign in us, even if by forsaking images we may seem to have departed from Egypt, 
Nevertheless, the reproach of Egypt has not been taken away from us. If, therefore, you receive this second circumcision of the vices and cut off every defect of wrath, pride, jealousy, lust, greed, partiality, and other such things from yourself, then the reproaches of Egypt are wiped away from you, transported to the land of promise. You will receive the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven through the true Jesus, Christ our Lord and Savior, to whom is the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that concludes Origins Homily Number 1 on Joshua.